place in mind. And what it's referring to is the fact that in Christ we can find a peace that we can't find anywhere else. And when we think of the complacent mind, it's exciting to know that when people, you have a hard time hearing me. So what I got? No one? Ah? Is it on back there? Okay. Uh, I guess I got it on here too, so thank you for letting me go tonight. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. Okay. Can y'all hear me in the back? Okay. Do I need to speak up a little bit more? Do I need to yell at y'all? <laughs> okay. Yeah, Richard goes by and yell. Okay. It was muted. Huh? It was muted. It was, okay. Well, he was muted, huh? I think I can hear me now, too. Oh, wow. I hope I enjoy what I hear. <laughs> so when we talk about the complacent mind, uh, it's important for us in this day and age. There's so many people that, this day, so there's a lot of sick people out there. And when I say that there's a lot of people that their mind is so messed up, that's the reason you have people killing others. Uh, that's the reason you have suicides. And that's the reason you have people just doing strange things because their mind's not right. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of the brain. And so when we go to him, it's like he's got the owner's manual, which if you had the Bible, I looked at that as our owner's manual in a very real sense. He knows exactly what we need so that we can have a mind that's peaceful in an unpeaceful world. And so as we look here, what God says here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, as we get into our introduction, says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so it's exciting because usually when they think of, well, somebody's hungry, that means they need food, okay? And I was talking to a couple of diabetics just a moment ago, and they were saying, yeah, at certain times they have to eat or they're going to be in trouble. And so we need to realize that spiritually the same thing's true, that we need to feed our minds spiritually. And of course, that comes by accepting Christ as our Savior and then let Him lead us in our life, let Him become our Lord or our boss. And so as you look at it here, it says that God says that those are blessed that are searching for Him. Those that want to know more about Jesus. And so, again, how exciting it is because he says that he can fill them with righteousness. And folks, I, I need all the righteousness I can get. And I know that you, uh, if you're like me, never sit here can raise your hands. I got enough righteousness. I don't need any more preacher. You know? uh, and how exciting it is when we see God working in our life. And the fact is that God is the righteous one. And that word righteous means to do right. And so I'm so glad that God can help us to do the right thing as we uh, come to know him as our Savior. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, uh, that's what was talking about right there. And again, we find that we live in a world where there's so many people that are lazy. And uh, laziness has crept into our society. And again, it's sad. And I think there's two qualities that are far more prevalent in this generation. And uh, when I talk about that, because so many people have gotten out of the habit of working a regular job or whatever. And again, we know situations happen where sometimes it's not easy, but we find that we, we have students that have a hard time studying. Uh, I, I very rarely meet some young person that says, oh, I just love to study, I love to study. You know? uh, they have to work at it. And I'll be honest, you know, I have to work at it when I'm studying for a message or whatever too. Sometimes it's easier to go out and get beat up than it is to study. Oh, can I say that? But, but anyhow, yeah, what am I trying to say? That it's important for us to learn that we need to use our mind. And so many times it's so easy just to sit there and watch TV. And folks, yeah, I do watch TV. And yeah, I probably watch it too much. Uh, but you probably do too. But anyhow, yeah, maybe not. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to learn how to let the Lord give us what we need. And so many times the reason we watch the things that we watch or, or we get into the things that we get into is because we're searching for something, but the only thing that can really fill it is God himself. And God wants to fill us with that special need that we have in our life. And so as we look at the Apostle Paul, he was a very religious man when he got saved. But when I say he was a religious thing, well, that was a good thing. And, and folks, it was a sad thing because he was so religious that if somebody wasn't going to follow his beliefs, he just went ahead and killed them and tortured them. And uh, so of all things, uh, the Apostle Paul was a, a killer of Christians. 
And he thought he was doing a work for God by killing Christians. Ugh, isn't that sad? But wow, what a change that took place in his life when he finally filled that void with Jesus. And so that's what we want to talk to you. The purpose of our message today is simply to help you develop, you ready, a sound mind. And I, I think when I was talking to uh, Renee and Matt, I was telling them that I'm doing a little brainwashing on Sundays. And then I went ahead and explained that we're just trying to get our brains clean, okay? Get our brains so we can receive from God what God has for us. And so as we look here, uh, again, it's important for us if we want to clean and cleanse our mind that we spend time reading God's Word. And God's Word can help our mind to develop in such a way that it becomes more God. And how exciting it is when we become more like God. And so goals I want to share with you is the fact that I want you to have a, a desire to study God's Word, to learn more about God. And that's so important. Uh, I love when people are excited about coming to church and they go, man, I just, uh, I, I, I just look forward to hearing something you know, different, but also I know it's it's the same thing once in, but yet it's just given in a different way or whatever. And they look forward to coming to church and being involved in the services here. And uh, look forward maybe to meeting some new people or seeing some old people that hadn't been here for a while or whatever. But again, we want you to see the importance of reading and studying God's Word. In today's space, there's a lot of apps and different things that you can put on your phone. And uh, you can actually have your phone talk to you and read the scriptures to you. So it's really a fantastic age to live in. But then also I want to stir the, and challenge your minds, if you please, to hearing the preaching of the Word of God. And folks, are you ready for this? There's some really good preachers out there. You ready for this? There's preachers. I know you're going to find this hard, but they're actually better than me. <laughs> oh, come on. folks! just wants to go, oh, no. <laughs> okay. But what I'm saying, there's some... Fantastic preaching taking place out there. But we can learn something from good preachers. And, and we, we need to find people that can help us in our growth. And then also we need to cease from being lazy or idle. And given no chance for the devil to tempt us. Now, what's the old saying? A, an idle mind is the devil's, the devil's workshop. Okay. And there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? And it's sad how many people have allowed that to happen, that their minds become idle. And what I'm saying is that we can constantly be thinking about things of God. And you say, really? Yeah, but think about it. Did you pray for your preacher today? Did your preacher pray for you today? I did. I really did. Every one of you that are in there, I prayed for you today. Janet, I prayed extra hard for you. So I knew you had a ride with my wife at church. <laughs> okay, but what I'm trying to say is seriously, we can constantly be thinking about the things of the Lord and, uh, and, and about each other and praying for God, you know, because everybody is facing temptations and trials. And when our mind is idle, it gives the devil free reign in our life, and that's a dangerous thing. So we need to commit ourselves to the Lord. And then we need to motivate each of us to spend time in reading God's Word but also there's good books about God's Word. There's books out there that can help Christians to grow in their relationship with the Lord. And so we usually try to have some sort of material for you. And a lot of times we do have secular material out there. And when I say that, uh, things about what's happening in the uh, government, and what's happening in the world. And so many newspapers, and things, they're just not being honest. And so we try to find things that are truthful and honest that you can look at and know that you're hearing the truth. Then moving along, we need to understand what truth of the Bible that is worth more than all the wisdom of man. You understand it? I mean, what we get from God's word, just one truth from God's word is more valuable than everything that the world has to offer. Jesus kind of put it this way, he said, what should a man uh, gain if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? And I don't think it's that quite right, but uh, that's what the verse implies. So in other words, you could gain the whole world, all the riches and all the power that's involved in it. But if you don't accept Christ, you've lost it all. And it's, it's worth nothing. And then the Lord makes it very clear that, that one soul is worth more than the whole world. Isn't that staggering? Isn't it amazing how much God feels you're worth? And so it's sad that many times people feel like they're just so worthless, you know, that there's just no good in them or whatever. 
Folks, if you got Jesus Christ, you got the best. That, that's the good thing that we all need to have. And again, having him work in our lives is so exciting. And so as we, we get into our message here before we go any further, I want to ask God's blessing on our service today. And uh, Ron, would you pray for us, Brother? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thanks for being here today with us. God, we ask you to guide us in the message and learn to love one another and take the violence away from all these terrible things. God, I ask you to watch over the congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Ron. And so, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, and again, this is our series on what's in your mind or what's on your mind. And as we look here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, very short verse, and again, it says so much. It says, that, and this is Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy was one of his preacher boys. And as he's writing to him, he's trying to encourage him. He was uh, a very young pastor. When I say very young, you might say, well, how young? Many believe that he may have been as ready. He might have started out at the ripe old age of 16 pastoring a church. Now, I don't know. That's, that's pretty young. I mean, uh, it, that's amazing. But Paul did everything he could have helped. He had a father that was not a believer. And, and we go, but his grandmother was a believer. His mother was a believer. And, of course, he himself was a believer when he, he uh, began to meet Paul and work with Paul. And so Paul was very, very concerned for this young man. And uh, uh, some interesting verses in, uh, that we find in the scriptures that were relating to him. Because Paul actually said, let no man despise your youth. And uh, have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Man, youth is wasted on the young people. You know, and, like it's not fair for us old people not to have all that energy that they have and so forth. But move along. When we look here in our introduction, again, I am having a lot of eye problems today, so uh, I'm sorry I'm maybe a little bit slower, so it's hard to see things. And uh, hopefully it'll clear up. I'll put some drops in, and, and I'm hoping it'll do better here in a little bit, okay? But you can pray for me, okay? So uh, in our introduction again, both the body and the brain have a tendency to be lazy. Uh, you don't have to teach your kids to be lazy. It just comes natural. And so, again, you have to teach them the opposite. You have to teach them to be industrious and to be involved in, in working and being active and so forth. But modern technology allows and encourages us to put our brains in our, at uh, neutral. Uh, again, I think of television. Uh, and when I think of, uh, we, had a, we have a teacher named John Yates that teaches in our Faith Bible Institute. And most of our people are familiar with Brother John Yates. But he'll tell you how he got saved. He said he, he was, uh, his folks lived out on the farm there in Louisiana. And he said of all things, he had a chance to sit at the house to watch TV. And of all things, he said, Billy Graham's Crusades came on. And when Billy Graham's Crusades came on, he said, if he had had a remote control, he would have changed the station. But he said, I just was too tired to get up and, and change the station, uh, change the channel. And he said, as a result, I got saved. <laughs> and I'm so glad John Gates got saved. No question he got saved. And it's been a tremendous blessing to thousands of people around the world. And, but it was just because he was too lazy to get up because it was before you know, the, the remotes. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, how many of us can identify with it? Sometimes we just watch something because maybe we can't find a remote or whatever. But what I'm saying is it's very, very important for us to realize that it's so easy to get sidetracked. Uh, you know how many times I, I look in the building, I see people, and they got their phones out, and they're working on their phones. And my son just told me, he said, Dad, with my eyesight, it's better because I have a better background. So I'm actually reading the scriptures. And I go, oh, okay. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, so now I understand that people can have their phone out there. And it can be for a good reason, not because they're playing a game, you know, because they're bored with the preaching or whatever. But they can actually see uh, the, the word of God easier when they have their, their on their phone of all lines. So it's amazing and the technology that we have. But because of it, it's also easy to get in trouble. And it's easy to get involved in things that we have no business getting involved in. And so again, uh, we can use the phones for God's glory, uh, or we can use it for the devil. And I, I know I was talking to, uh, when I, I met 
Brother Matthew here, and I can call him brother now. But when I met him, he told me he was a hunter. And uh, and I just said something about, you know, some people, they, they're totally against guns because some bad things have happened with guns. And folks, that's true, some bad things have happened with guns, but you think of all the good that has happened with guns. And again, it depends on who's using the gun and how it can be used. And uh, I could go on and on. I think about it. How many people were killed this last year by cars? So we should get rid of cars, shouldn't we? I mean, you know, and how many people lost their homes because they got they got caught on fire? We need to outlaw fire, you know, and we'd be just going on. But when I say it's silly again because it's because somebody's mind is messed up that they shot somebody else. It's because somebody's mind was maybe messed up or they were high on drugs and they, they drove off a cliff or whatever. And, and we could just go on and on. And again, uh, you can have your mind in the right state and somebody can hit you or you could still have an accident, okay? But again, it's so many people have allowed their minds to wander off in all these different areas and God says, give me your mind and I can help you with your mind. And believe me, we can do a whole lot more and we can do a whole lot more good when we give our mind to God. And it's one of those things going to go, wow, why didn't I do this earlier? Why didn't I do this before? What took me so long to, to finally just give my brain to him and let him control my life? And folks, it's exciting what God can do with you. And again, so many times uh, our mind, uh, we're either going to determine to do right or to do wrong. And it all determined up here. And I know some people, you know, they're so spiritual, they'll say something like, well, preacher, the devil made me do it, you know. And, <laughs> You ever heard that phrase? Okay, and I'm sure you have. And uh, maybe you've used that yourself. But folks, let's face it. When wrong comes about in our life, or we sin, or we do something that we shouldn't do, it's usually because we thought it up. And we allowed our mind to stray where it should not have strayed. And so, again, uh, as I think in those terms, it's so important for us as Christians to work on putting our mind in the right place. Uh, so that God can help us. And, and again, once we do it, it's one of those things that go, wow, I wish I'd done this sooner, you know? And uh, it's one of those things that you'll really be excited when you go, wow, I just did this and I felt so good about it. And why did I do it? And then you realize God was the one who led you to do what you did that was such a blessing to you and somebody else. And again, God wants to help us. And so as he was writing here to young Timothy, he was in a cold, damp, Roman prison. My wife and I have had the pr uh, privilege of being in this prison. And uh, folks, it's right there in the city of Rome. It wasn't too far from where the, uh, the big uh, stadium is and so forth. We got to go to that stadium also. And, uh, but as we went into uh, the maritime prison, as we went into it, of course it's not a prison now, but you can kind of look down in there and it's really dark, you know, and they had some lights on the way. And you look down this hole, and then what happens is you look down there, there's like a ledge you can see so far down there, and then there's another ledge down below that. And, and what happens is those people lived off on the edges. And then they would take whatever they needed to take, and they would put it down on a rope like their food or water, and then they would start swinging it, and then they would grab it, and that's how they would get the water or the food or whatever. And anyhow, it was a very, very... Um, moldy type smell. We went into the catacombs too in Rome and anyhow yeah, it was quite an experience and uh, uh, Paul was writing from that dark gloomy place but he was writing of all things and sending a special light to his son and the Lord so to speak to Timothy to try to encourage him and he's actually had Nero has placed judgment on him and Nero's going to have his head chopped off and yet we see him so positive. And we know later on it refers to the fact that there was uh, Christians that were soldiers that were in the house of Caesar. And I can't help but think that those guys had to spend time with Paul somewhere along the way. And as a result, Paul was able to lead them to Christ. And, uh, and when Paul describes the, the, the soldier, or putting on armor like a soldier, uh, the Christian armor, no doubt he was looking at those soldiers and as he looked at them he began to you know apply spiritual things to those soldiers and to the 
the things that they were wearing, like the breastplate of righteousness and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the sword of the Lord's that he pleased and the helmet of salvation and all those things as he looked at them, he applied spiritual applications to them. So we find that Paul, as he's writing here uh, in, to Timothy, and he's trying to encourage him along the way, but also we find that he has to request. And he told him basically, said, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. So we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, as Paul is in his dying moments, he's got the death, uh, the, the execution's coming, and he's going to be meeting the, the executioner, if you please, and maybe something like you've seen on TV or seen in a book, and the guy very likely could have had a black hood over his head and, and uh, you know, had those big biceps and everything else. And, and uh, as he came, he was ready to take his ax and he was able to hit him and literally chop his head off in one blow. And Paul, no doubt, witnessed to that man and said, hey, I'm fixing to go to heaven. Let me tell you about it. And so, no doubt, he witnessed to the very end. But here, even though he knows it, he has just a short time. What would you do if you knew? And when I say it, I mean, he knew exactly, basically, when he was going to die. The date had been set. He knew it was coming at any moment. But he said, be sure to bring my Bible. <laughs> bring the parchment. And, and those books I was reading, uh, you know, at such and such role, bring those too, because they're really good. They've been a tremendous help. And then I, I, I bring my coat, because it really is cold down here. Isn't it amazing all the things that he, and yet he's fixing to die. And you think, well, why, how's that going to help him to read the scriptures? I mean, how's it going to, you know, but he wanted God's word to help him. And he emphasizes the importance of that, that folks, we need to stay right with God, no matter what's happening. I don't know about you, any of you ever been sick? Okay, my wife and me, okay. oh, Richard. It, it, let me ask you, how many of you really enjoy it when you get sick? <laughs> and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think, go, oh man, I can't wait to get sick again, you know. But what I'm saying is sometimes when we get sick, the, I hate to say the true you comes out, <laughs> but sometimes it's amazing when somebody gets sick, just how mean and ornery they can be. Okay. You don't have to raise your hand in confession, okay, or anything like that. But what I'm saying is, we sometimes do stupid things when we're sick, don't we? And folks, I don't have to be sick to do stupid things. But anyhow, but sometimes we do stupid things. And especially when we're sick sometimes. And the, the last thought of mine is, man, I just can't wait. I feel so miserable. I just can't wait to get the Bible here so I can read it. But what I want to say is when you finally break in, and like with me, many times my wife says, honey, let me bring you your Bible, bring me something, you know, like that to help you. Or she'll say, have you read your Bible, <laughs> you know, this morning or whatever. And so she encourages, and sure enough, shortly after I do that, uh, I get in and go, yeah, this is what I needed. And what I'm saying is we need to spend time with God. Uh, any of you ever gotten a love letter? And I know I've asked this many times before. Any of you ever gotten a love letter? Okay, all right. Richard holds up his Bible, uh, so he's listening a few times around here. But the Bible is a love letter from God to you. And you say, well, that's to the whole world. And that's true, it is to the whole world, but it's also to you as an individual. And as you study God's word, you'll see how much he loved you. But Paul, in his last days, he had a, a hunger still in his soul to learn more about God. He wrote 14 books of the 27 books of the New Testament, but he still wanted to learn more about God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that exciting? That he, he, you think if anybody had ever attained a place where, wow, I mean, he was a super, super duper saint, and he was, but he still wanted to grow, and he knew that he could still grow and get closer to the Lord in his relationship with him. <coughs> so again, I think it's important for every one of us, no matter how we feel, that we we spend it with God. And so, again, Paul was practicing what he preached here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, as he encourages us to get into the Word. And then, those that uh, Roman number 1 today, 
the challenge of the searching mind. Give attendance to reading is what it says in the scriptures. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Till I come, give attendance to reading. So Paul is encouraging Timothy and, if you please, others in that church because Timothy read the letter to the others in his church. And, of course, now we're reading it to our church here at Antioch right now. So it's exciting uh, when you think of how it's able to apply it not just to Timothy but to all of us. But he said to the people, he says, listen to the reading of the Word of God. Listen to the teaching, the explanation of the Word of God from the man of God, if you please. But statistics show that Americans spend more money annually, you ready, on chewing gum yep. than on books. Now chew on that, okay? <laughs> but that, that's hard to believe, is it not? But while reading is important, what you read is far more important. And I, I mean, think about it. Because you can read garbage, and what's the old saying? Garbage in, garbage out, you know, so to speak. And, uh, uh, and so that's dangerous. But we can also feed ourselves, if you please, on good information. Information that won't clutter our brains so much, and especially as we wait upon God and let God work in us. And then people can see the demonstration of God in your life, in my life. So I'm amazed at, at, at how enamored we are with the wisdom of men and how bored we get with God's truth. Isn't that amazing that we said, well, this guy said, oh, they got a new religion starting over here. They got new, and, and we'll listen and say, oh, this guy's supposed to be the smartest man in the world today, you know, and, and we go over all these things. But in reality, sometimes people just get bored with church. They get bored with the word of God. And I think how sad. And I can't help but see in my mind, and maybe you'll see it in your mind too, that I can see the devil over the court and go, wow, I got him right where I want, you know? And he'll do what he can to encourage us to be discouraged, okay? And he wants to do that. And so again, as we think of what God has given to us, there are so many things that we uh, listen to that we really need to be listening to the Word of God. I remember years ago, uh, I went to hear Jack Howes and, and uh, John R. Rice at a Sword of the Lord uh, conference. And I remember John Rice got up and the first thing he did, he was, he was I think he was always old, but anyhow, he, he was a, uh, an old man. And uh, when I say old, I think he was in his mid eighties at that time. And he just broke down and made a confession to the church, or I'd say the church, there was a number of churches there. And he said, I, I am so sorry. He said, please forgive me. He said, today when I got up, I started to get my Bible and there in the motel, there, uh, there was a newspaper right there and I ended up reading the newspaper before I read my Bible. And I want you to know, it really messed me up. And, and he was just serious, I mean, he was, he actually began weeping. He said, I'm so sorry. And I've asked God to forgive me and I want y'all to forgive me because uh, things could have been a little bit different if I had done what I should have done to begin with, and that was read God's word. And so anyhow, I thought that was kind of unique, and that's one that sticks out in my brain, the fact that he made a confession of all his people, I'm sorry, I, I did wrong today. And he was so disturbed about it, and that's another thing that made because he had not read God's word when he first got up, got involved in something else. And again, in this day and age, that is so easy it, to get involved in other things. But uh, as I think of this, again, I look in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. And it says this, I, uh, as I look at it, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And y'all remember back when the pandemic began? And said, so, yeah, I'm okay. Remember one of the first things, and at the time it was President Trump, but one of the first things he said, folks, I want you to know that we got fantastic scientists and you can trust our scientists and our scientists will find a cure for all of us and they're gonna find it right away in record time. Our scientists have the answer for this plague. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, God has the answer for the plague, if you please, and other things. And, and, uh, uh, and, and what sat in my heart was the fact that they were saying, you can rely, you can trust our scientists. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if y'all aware of this, but the first president of the United States, he was killed by our scientists. And I realize he'd probably be dead now anyhow. But what happened is he got sick. He got, actually got a cold, and had pneumonia. And what happened is the doctors came in, and at that time, you ready? The doctors had a real professional sound of name they called the leeches. Okay? And you ever feel like they like a leech to your wallet, you know, when you come in or go in and see them, you know, and say, you need this medicine and this medicine and all these things. And, and uh, they go, wow, <laughs> this visit was $250. And all I did was say, hi, my name is such and such. Ugh, okay. But I'm sorry, getting off track a little bit. But what I'm trying to say is the scientists, the top scientists of the world, they told President Washington, we can help you. What's wrong is your blood is bad. And we're going to go ahead and take some of your blood out to get rid of that bad blood and make you better. Well, they bled him. And he didn't get any better. In fact, he actually got a little weaker. So then they bled him again, thinking that, oh, don't worry, we'll get rid of all the bad blood this next time. And then finally, the third time they bled him, and he died. Oh, okay. The scientists of today, you can say, well, that was back 200 plus years ago. Well, that's true. Uh, but if they had read the Bible, the Bible says very clearly in Deuteronomy and Leviticus that the life is in the blood. Oh. So according to the scientists, they needed to get rid of uh, all that bad blood. But according to God, we needed that blood. <laughs> it wasn't so bad after all. And, and, so you should, and then also, you, you ready? The scientists of the world said, <laughs> the earth is flat. And you ready? Some of the scientists of, of the particular time in the Middle Ages said that the earth is on top of a tortoise. And then there was another group that said, no, no, it's on the back of a large elephant. <laughs> and then someone said, no, no, Hercules is holding up the world. The scientists, we know, we know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and the Bible said, behold, in Job, he said it upon the circle of the earth. Oh, circle. I, it's a circle. It's still round, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it amazing how, how the Bible had all this truth from the very, very beginning because oh, God the Creator wrote this book. And we can trust it far more than we can the scientists of this world, if you please. And it's just, they're totally ignorant. And many of it says in the Bible, in Peter, it says that they're willingly ignorant of the flood and of the creation. Willingly. In other words, they refuse to accept what God says. So folks, let's learn to accept what he says. And again, those that said that the, the foolishness of God is so much greater than the wisest of the wise men, if you please. And we can go on. But know something else we read in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says this. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And folks, what a sad tragedy is we look at the book of Hosea and what happened to the people of Israel when they turned their back upon God and how the judgment came. And folks, I can't help but see that happen today here in our, uh, America, that in our schools, they're, they're teaching the kids that God is a fairy tale. Uh, they're teaching that we no longer need God because that was something that society needed and they developed the God. And folks, uh, it, it's unbelievable what's being taught in our schools today. But notice the following, it was, I found it in a leaflet uh, from Evangelist Bill Sunday. Billy Sunday was actually a, uh, a professional ball player when he got saved and uh, quite an interesting character. He was from right here in this area here. This is where he grew up, was in this part of the United States, right here in Indiana and Illinois. And so he wrote this. He said, 29 years ago, with the Holy Spirit as my guide, I entered at the portico of Genesis. Listen close as we get through this. And of course, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And I walked down through the corridor of the Old Testament, through the art galleries, were pictures of Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Isaac, Jacob, and Daniel hung on the walls. And so he's basically, he's going through the whole Bible and he's using it kind of in a poetical type way, talking about 
how that when he first got saved, how uh, Genesis and the other things began to work from there. And notice that it goes on. He said, I passed into the music room of Psalms, which would also be uh, the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Notice, he said, where the, the spirit sweeps the keyboard of nature until it seems that the, every reed and pipe in God's great organ responds to the harp of David, the sweet singer of Israel. I entered into the chamber of Ecclesiastes, where the voice of the preacher is heard, and into the conservatory of Sharon and the lily of the valley, where sweet spices filled and perfumed my life. I entered into the business office of Proverbs and on into the observatory of the prophets, where I saw the telescope of various sizes pointing to the far off events, concentrating on the bright morning star, which was to rise above the moonlit hills of Judea for our salvation and redemption. I entered the audience soon of the King of Kings, catching a vision written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thence into the correspondence room with Paul, Peter, James, and John, writing the epistles, and the epistles are, are letters. I stepped into the throne room of Revelation where the tower of the glittering peaks were, where sat the King of Kings upon his throne of glory, with the healing of the nations in his hand, and I cried out, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. And uh, this was printed by W.A. Criswell, a uh, Southern Baptist preacher, uh, for many years, a great, great man of God, uh, very much a gentleman. And uh, he shares this with us. So, I think the description that we read here and how exciting it is as we look at the description that's given to us uh, concerning God's Word. And again, there's so much that the word Bible, I don't know if you wear this, but it, it's a Latin word and it refers to library. And the Bible has 66 books in it, so it's actually a, a portable library, if you please. Uh, as we read it, God has something for every situation in our life. So again, give adherence to ruminating. You know what rumination is? Okay, I'm uh, for sure Jared does, but anyhow, uh, we used to own a dairy farm. Uh, we didn't actually run cattle on We had beef cattle on the time, time. But what I'm saying is, cows do something. They do a lot of things. But when they go to eat, they chew on something, then they swallow it, it goes into their first stomach. And then in just a little bit, you oftentimes see them sitting uh, under the trees or whatever. And a little bit, that cud comes back up and they start chewing again. And then it goes back down and they have four stomachs all together. Isn't that amazing? And each time they go through this process. And so what I'm trying to say is that you can read the Bible. So, well, preacher, I've read the Bible, so I'm through. <laughs> you know? And, and God says, no, no, you need to read it again. And you need to think or you need to study it. You need to meditate it. So I can speak to you, and, and so that you can learn what you need to learn for today. And so again, God's Word is so exciting that we need to learn how to study to show ourselves approved of the God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly to find the Word of Truth. And that's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And then Jesus also said that we are to search the Scriptures, for in them we think that we have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, John 5, 39. So how do we find eternal life? In God's Word. God shows us how that we can receive eternal life. That's the, that's such an important part of God's Word is for us to find things that will last for all eternity. And then again, as we read in the Scriptures in Proverbs chapter 2, in verses 1 through 5, we listen to Solomon as he's sharing some wisdom and Solomon's considered the wisest man that ever lived next to Jesus. And yet, Solomon did a lot of foolish things, did he not? But listen to what he says here. He said, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou priest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. And again, it's so important for us to 
do what God's Word says and look at the Bible as something far more than just an old book, okay? Uh, something more than a decoration that sits on a coffee table, but something that you you realize you need it and, and that there's something in there for you, but you, you can't find it until you start reading and start looking at it. And uh, God's not just going to slap us with the truth, if you please. He wants us to search for it and then apply it to our lives. So the second thought that we have is the challenge <coughs> of a stirred mind. I, I hope you get excited uh, about God's things. And uh, I know several of you today uh, let me know that you're very excited about some things that were happening in your life. And some of you are very excited about uh, what we were looking at in church today. And so that's great. But when we talk about the stirring, a stirring to exhortation, that means that we, we want to encourage each other. Uh, as we grow in the Lord. And it's amazing how the time will come, you look back, man, I really enjoy preaching. You go, I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> and there's other things that, and hopefully some will lead us. Man, I really enjoy Sunday school. I'm so glad we have Sunday school at our church. And, uh, and and you'll be excited about it. And then during the week, you catch yourself thinking about something and, and go, oh, yeah, that's what I heard in Sunday school, you know, whatever. And you'll apply it to your life and to your situation. 1 Timothy 4.13 again, he says, Till I come, in other words, Paul said that he, he was looking forward to coming uh, to see him. But he said, give attendance to exhortation. And again, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, we see that he's doing what he can to encourage the people by writing. The faithful preaching and teaching of God's word is designed to stir our minds. The apostle Peter wrote his second epistle for this very purpose because he knew that uh, that. The, the Christians and Israel and others were going to go through a real persecution uh, because of, if you please, Nero and so forth. Uh, Nero would be the equivalent of our Biden today, I guess. Okay. And uh, uh, he did things totally different. And uh, he was uh, he was a very confused man. And I've heard different stories. Some said it's because he uh, had lead poisoning in his system. And others said it was because of the way he drunk from his tin cups, which were considered expensive at that day and time. But anyhow, what I'm saying is uh, he was a crazy man, and it's because he was completely turned against God and God's truth. And so he did some very, very bad things and definitely fought against the church. Uh, he's the one that caught Rome on fire. And they said supposedly he played his fiddle, but I don't know if they had a fiddle then. But then when they came and everybody was upset about the, the burning of, of Rome, they said, well, it was the Christians that did it. The Christians did it. They're the ones that set Rome on fire. It wasn't me. Uh, okay. And so Christians have often been used uh, for excuses or whatever, scapegoats. So we see the apostle Peter here, we wrote the second epistle for this very purpose. He said, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I have stirred up your pure minds by way of remembrance. And folks, I think that one of the things that happens to us as Christians is as we grow in the Lord and as we get older and so forth, is we sometimes have a tendency to forget where we started. We have a tendency to forget when we got saved and, and how different our life was when we first got saved and how our life has changed. And that's something here in recent years I've, I've tried to constantly uh, remind myself of how I came to know Christ as my Savior. And I'm so thankful for Sergeant Davis that shared with me the plan of salvation. And he wanted me to get saved. He was so concerned. Uh, and he literally enlisted me in the Lord's army. But I'm so thankful for that love that he had for Christ and, and how he, he just became such a different person when Jesus came into him. And then I, I love sharing his testimony, how that he got drunk the night before, went out of town, beat up a bunch of people, the MP threw him, uh, they, several MPs threw him into the brig, and, and then the chaplain came in and said, I want to talk to you, uh, Sergeant Davis, and uh, so they don't want to share with you. And he said, I don't want to hear you, don't want to, but I, I can't go anywhere, so whatever. And so the chaplain took advantage of the situation, and as a result, when the chaplain entered that room, Davis was headed for hell. He knew he was going to hell, and he really didn't care a whole lot about it. He, he just, but when the chaplain left, he had a smile on his face, and he knew he was going to heaven. 
And I mean, what a total change it made in his life when he accepted Christ. But what I'm saying is I love to share that story. And, uh, and we need to remember where we were at and, and how much better things became when we accepted Christ as our Savior and how that he wants to work through us and how that he can work through us and do wonderful things. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says this. Again, Peter, you got to remember, did he ever mess up? Yeah, he messed up many times. Many people compare Peter to a bull in a china closet. <laughs> and uh, as you look at his life, you see he was either hot or he was cold. He never seemed like he was in between. But as we read this verse here, he said, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as that long as I am in this tabernacle, referring to his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Now, Paul was a fisherman. That was his profession. He was a professional fisherman. And yet, as you look at his writings and so forth, you can see that how more could a fisherman write like that, you know, or whatever. And you realize that God inspired him and helped him to share the good news about Jesus with others. We see the seduction of the lapsing. In other words, there's a problem that's easy for us to say, well, I don't need to tell that anymore. I don't need to share it with anybody else. But today people think that they have killed the fatted calf. If they go to church on Sunday morning, I had pastor so lucky I came to church today, you know, and then someone else may go to the other said, well, I actually put something in the offering. That preacher was really lucky that I was there today. You know, and someone else might say, well, I came to church and I sang, so I've done something for God. <laughs> and, and, and folks, it should be just the opposite. Wow, I've got to go to church today. I've got to give something to the Lord today. I've got to sing with God's people today. I, I've got to fill and, and be around in fellowship with other Christians and other believers. It was so exciting. Again, the early church, they were in a constant state of revival. Yet they were constantly being persecuted for their beliefs. And folks, I have read a number of articles here in recent days and it sounds like our church is definitely headed for persecution and persecution has happened literally in, in LA and some other areas uh, some of our pastors uh, of our same strike if you please were locked up for having church services during the pandemic uh, and unbelievable it actually happened in Canada even more so in Canada that they locked up more of the preachers for having church services and so anyhow we could go on and on, but there's a lot of things happening, and yes, we, uh, we have a persecution, and people are doing what they can to keep us from having our services and from sharing the good news. Notice what it says in Hebrews 10, 25, and actually I think uh, Brother Jay pulled this verse to me a couple times this last week, or well, Tuesday when we went to the fellowship meeting. But this verse says, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Folks, are you ready for this? We really are in the last days. There's no question about it. When you see all the things that are happening around us, and all the things that are being accepted by the world, which just a few years ago, there's no way uh, some of the things would have been accepted that uh, people just said, well, that's just a normal money, or that's just a different lifestyle. That's okay to have a different lifestyle. And, uh, Folks, it's like saying, it's okay to live for the devil. That's all right. There's no problem there. It's just the, the way they choose to live. That's that, that's okay. That's just another lifestyle. Well, if he kills people, he kills people. They couldn't die anyways, you know. So uh, it's sad, the philosophies that we're seeing out there right now. But God says, when you see that philosophy, then you need to repent. Turn back to me and get your life where it needs to be. And be back with God's people in church. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns with broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 2.13. So folks, we either choose to do right or we choose to do wrong. And you say, well, I'll choose just to be neutral. I'm going to do just right. I mean, okay, you choose to do wrong, okay? And that's what it boils down to. And it's sad that so many times we, we see our pews in our church are empty. And so many times it's because people just say, well, I don't really need church anymore. I, I can make it on my own. 
uh, or whatever. And it's just sad to see uh, the parking lots that the police at the football game or at the race cars, NASCAR, or whatever those type of places. And I'm not preaching against those things right now. But you'll see them just crammed full, or you go by a local bar and be crammed full of cars up there, and motorcycles, whatever. And you see all those people there, and then you know maybe you go by the theater or whatever. And, and you see all these people there, and then you go by the church building. Not very many cars there, is there? <laughs> Not very many people there. And what a tragedy, because if anything, we definitely need church more now than ever before. And so uh, Jeremiah uh, was known as the weeping prophet. And he lived over 800 years before Christ was born. And yet we see that he, he told the truth. And well, I mean, you talk about being tortured. He was tortured over and over again for preaching the truth. And it was the, the uh, if you please, those that were in authority, the, the kings and so forth, that were constantly torturing him. And uh, again, just amazing. He continued to preach. And one time he said, I'm not going to preach anymore, but the, the insides, as he was trying to be right with God, it just began to burn in such a way that he had to preach the word of God. So again, we need to preach and share. Be careful about getting too comfortable in the things of this world, okay? Again, we need to take heed, rather, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 13. So in a world that is daily numbs our minds into believing a lie, we need the exhortation of God's word to stir us up to the truth. So we want to go ahead and stop there because our time's up, okay? And uh, uh, we got some new folks in here. The preaching's different than the teaching, okay?